So ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Zosari will be talking about respiratory and tech. Mr. Zosari is an alumni of the pharmacy faculty UITM. Uh, he is a pharmacist with experience in clinical and especially respiratory fields, and he has a strong passion for patient care. Uh, he is very talented in giving counseling, yeah, and also an exceptional health services to patients. Uh, Mrs. Osairi has been practicing in respiratory pharmacy for more than 10 years, and he is currently the uh, member as well in the working committee at the ministry level for respiratory working group. Yeah, and he is active in research and very motivated in his work, and we look forward to hear more from you. So, Dr. Uh, inshallah, soon, Dr. Zosairi, please proceed. 15 minutes is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Yes, all okay, right. okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Norgasian, for the welcoming speech. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and uh, good afternoon to all lecturers, uh, pharmacists, and master students. Okay, uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mala, for inviting me to share some experiences from uh, respiratory medication therapy adherence clinic, also known as uh, RMTEC. Okay, so personally, I, I think I feel pleased that you at the end did highlight on the MTAC as part of uh, Masters, and I believe from the DC celebrate as well. Okay, uh, furthermore, um, after this presentation, I think it should be better if I can get some ideas or opinions and suggestions on how to further strengthen our uh, MTAC uh, in general and especially MTAC. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, so today I want to uh, give a talk about the challenges for RM tech pharmacies, uh, especially during COVID-19. So uh, most of my slides consist most of the pictures, and I will talk more because this one more to the experiences. Okay, okay. So it's a bit about the background about um, M tech itself. M tech is uh, was introduced in uh, 2004, started by Hospital Melaka, and now we have uh, nearly about 14 uh, respiratory M tech training centers in Malaysia. Okay, main objective of uh, respiratory M tech, of course, is to help patients in managing their asthma, including to maximize uh, the benefit of medication therapy. To increase patient adherence, of course, because from the MTEC is that medication therapy adherence clinic. And then uh, the role of MTEC as well to educate and encourage patients on the appropriate use of uh, asthma and COPD medication. And mostly importantly, to collaborate with um, uh, healthcare providers on the medication related issues. Okay, so as you can see, this is the APR, Assisted Probatan Respiratory, as uh, you know, which is located in. Um, one of the busiest uh, roundabout in Malaysia, Bulatan Pahang. Originally, it was known as Pusat Ibi Negara. And from 1996, it's uh, known as IPR, whereby it is a center for respiratory training as well as referral center for any respiratory uh, related issue, including cancer, lung fibrosis, asthma, COPD, so on and so forth. Okay, so. Uh, since the first case of pandemic COVID on uh, last year, March 2020, actually, uh, respiratory impact pharmacists are struggling with some challenges, uh, etc., in order to maintain the sustainability of uh, respiratory impact. As all of us know, COVID-19 is primarily involving uh, respiratory symptoms. So we are frequently exposed to patients who are having respiratory problems, and without no doubt, they might be a carrier of COVID-19. However, most hospitals nowadays uh, do a very strict screening test before patients are allowed to enter the clinic. Okay, so um, this is, uh, these are one of the, some of the challenges that we are facing uh, during COVID-19 in related to respiratory impact, but I think we, maybe we have more than this, but I try to focus on this point um, first, it's about spacer versus nebulizer. Secondly, about perception of spacer. And third one is about those conversions from nebulizer to uh, valve holding chamber plus MDI. The fourth one is the availability of valve holding chamber. Or is it possible we 
custom made or homemade the espresso. And please talk about the counseling session by pharmacists. This is actually quite challenging for us uh, for, as a respiratory pharmacist. And the sixth one about the spir spirometry and spectrometer, I will explain uh, further in, 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 on the next slide. And next one is about recent uh, action plan, recent asthma action plan. Sorry, I missed the asthma. Recent asthma action plan, WAAP, and the, the, the next one is uh, adherence. Okay, now I'm talking about the first challenge and second challenge. I just combine both, which is a pressure versus nebulizer and perception by high care providers and patients on the pressure itself. Okay, I think uh, most of us know pressure in, in, the, in the brain name, we call it arrow chamber. Okay, so this first picture is a pressure, and the second one is a valve holding chamber, and the third picture is about nebulizer. So the differences between spacer and buff holding chamber is about the word buff because this buff holding chamber got to have a valve so it can prevent from the big worst of a, a medications a medication exhaling. Okay, so our mission for these two challenges is about the discuss the argument for MDI use compared to nebulizer use. And next about the dose conversion from nebulizer to uh, method dose inhaler and buff holding chamber. And now next is to learn how to use MDI. I try to focus more on the certain important points, not all the steps. Important points that we need to know about how to use the uh, buff holding chamber. So before I talk further, let me explain about uh, the aerosols. Okay, aerosol generating procedure is very, very critical, um, uh, especially during COVID-19, especially during CPR, during nebulizers, during um, using high flow natural cannula, because all of this can generate aerosols. Okay. Okay. So from this uh, for CPR, you can see here, you can see that uh, they are testing with this um, dummy uh, uh, toys. Uh, Whereby you can see here, they are uh, when when doing uh, when they doing the CPR, we can we can see that there are aerosols generated. This is actually quite dangerous for the healthcare providers. Okay, and this is one of the um, the procedure and the transmission um, by systemic review uh, showing that there are some aerosols generated during CPR. Okay. So radio label bentonin, uh, this is one of the pictures from the Castro Rodriguez showing that um, compared with MDI, method dose inhaler and valve holding chamber, nebulizer actually can cause more GI deposition, meaning that it can cause more side effects, including um, hypokalemia and palpitations and all. But for those patients using with um, fitted mask, especially valve holding chamber, most of, the, most of the medication will be um, delivered straight away to the lungs and uh, contribute towards high bioavailability of the medication to the lungs. Okay, so this one we can see actually um, from high flow natural canola or we call it natural pong, you can see that actually based on here, you can see that 10 liter per minute, you can see the next feature is 25 liter per minute and 25 liter per minute. All of this might, might generate uh, aerosols. Okay. Okay. Thus, actually, um, method dose inhaler and buff holding chamber is the preferred option to use because first, it can reduce the risk of infection. Secondly, it can reduce cost, and third one, it can it's a more efficacy and it can reduce side effect. But how about the cost and how about the efficacy itself? Okay. So method dose this one uh, from uh, Amira at all showing that actually. We said just inhaler and uh, accessory, accessory, accessory device should be the first line treatment in acute asthma. And this is another uh, study from Jose. And this one uh, they consists of primary outcome and secondary outcome showing that uh, fibrous uh, meter just inhaler and buff holding chamber compared with nebulizer. So in conclusion, here you can see that meter just inhaler and buff holding chamber should be used as a first choice to administer beta agonists in children less than five years of age for the treatment of acute anticipation of wheezing or asthma and ED. So actually most of the study was conducted for kids, for pediatrics, but actually this one also can apply to adults as well. 
Okay, this one is the latest and largest uh, systematic review by Pollock et al. showing that actually uh, Saba, which is shock acting beta agonist, should be given as the first line bronchodilator with the use of method dose inhaler plus pressure in children with mild to moderate attack, particularly in young children. In terms of cost, cost effectiveness, I found that this uh, journal showing that from this one from uh, Canada, showing that MDI plus abutamol inhalation was associated with significant economic gains compared with nebulizer. Okay, so before I proceed further, so what are the differences between spacer and valve holding chamber? Because I will keep talking about the VHC, which is the short form for valve holding chamber. Okay. So spacer, spacer are essentially devised to be used with PMDI and spacer that are incorporated with a valve, we call it, uh, it valve holding chamber. Okay, so valve holding chamber, what are the difference? What are the benefits of using valve holding chamber compared with uh, spacer is that actually it's one way in spacery valve protecting the patient from poor hand breath coordinated. Use tidal breathing or single breathing method. So we can use both tidal breathing and single breathing method. And second one is as, but we can uh, slow down and measure the droplet so patient can inhale the uh, medication uh, effectively. And third one is better lung distribution and the third one is large particles. Okay. So from this uh, diagram, you can see that um, for MDI alone, it can cause uh, mostly or about oropharyngeal loss meaning that it can absorb in the orophangal um, layer. So this is one of the things that contribute towards the highest uh, systemic effect with MDI. Okay, second thing is, is we can see from this graph uh, showing that compared with um, method dose inhaler, uh, nebulizer, and dry powder inhaler, DPI is dry powder inhaler, MDI is better, more lungs uh, having more lungs deposition with 14.5%. But the most important thing is it should be sit upright and you cannot actuate multiple doses at one time. Okay. All right. So the third challenge is about the dose conversion. So this is quite challenging because uh, actually the COVID-19 happened uh, in Malaysia about starting uh, about March. And then we have to think about how to convert from the dose from the nebulizer into the method dose inhaler plus VHT. So this is one of the uh, references where uh, we use to replace nebulizer by MDI. So this one actually studied because of during last time we have a SARS, SARS um, pandemic. Uh, I'm not calling pandemic. So because they use this uh, sample to uh, to convert the dose. So actually the Malaysian Thoracic Society um, has uh, this is the recommendation from uh, Malaysian Thoracic Society in terms of uh, conver com uh, conversion from nebulizer dose to method dose inhaler uh, dose. Okay, so this is the slide normally I give uh, to staff nurses um, uh, and uh, healthcare providers regarding how to convert from nebulizer to method dose inhaler. Okay, this is the uh, sample picture. So with diagram pictures, we can uh, staff nurses and healthcare providers I think can be more understand regarding how to convert, what is the conversion factors, what are the devices, how physically we can see from the medication. So it can be a clear picture. Okay, this one, all right. So uh, at the same time, you have to educate the staff nurse and the healthcare providers about the common mistakes of uh, MDI plus DHT. So first of all, it's not priming, failure to prime for new inhalers. And second thing is about the failure to shake each time before actuation. This one very important. And multiple actuations during inhalation also is very, very important. So you have to actuate one pass each inhalation process and wrong assembly of the MDI plus DHC. Okay, but the, the, the thing is actually the, the issues coming and coming to us and then they're asking about can inhalers and bar volume chambers be shared? Actually, um, Malaysian Transit Society recommended that inhalers and valve on each chamber should not be shared. So this is the problem. So if not can be shared, so actually we don't have um, we don't have a specific uh, space uh, actually initially in the emergency department during that COVID-19. So how we're going to have got uh, enough supply for valve on each chamber when we are not expecting that to be happen in that particular month on March. 
So, uh, and then this one, and then that one is about college level. But how about the MBI itself? Can be shared by most of the journals, including um, uh, Malaysian Trusted Society, saying that it cannot be shared. So, also we have asked um, one of the Aero Chambers uh, representatives saying that it can be disinfected during the very strong uh, solution, but still it cannot be shared with uh, other patients. So, the problem is what if my patient cannot um, purchase, afford the commercial spacer? So, what we can do with that? Can we do homemade, custom made spacer with plastic bottle? Is it acceptable and everything? So before we, I proceed further, I, will, I just want to highlight about the uh, four points um, regarding the issues on custom made spacer, size and shape, and about the electrostatic charge, and absence of one way valve, and a single break maneuver method. So all of this should be taken into consideration before we can design a spacer which is uh, suitable to the patient. Luckily, what challenge? So, the Global Asthma Report 2018 has shown that actually we can do the custom made spacer by um, using 500 ml water bottles. Okay, this is the picture showing that the, the innovation is coming, um, come handy. So, on March 2020, Pharmacy is coming up all these um, innovations and how to um, supply the spacer before we're getting the proper spacer from uh, like for buff of and all. So a lot of um, innovations was uh, coming up. So from this journal showing that the 500 milliliter plastic bottles as an effective for children with asthma. So this is supported by Gina uh, report 2018. So yeah, this is uh, actually this one is um, normally applicable for those who cannot afford to buy buff of chamber. Okay, and next one we have to teach how to make a bottle spacer. A bottle uh, spacer. It's not really like you know you just make a hole and put in the area and then that's it. No, because you have a lot of steps uh, to, to to ensure that the water bottles, uh, the custom made spacer, we call it, it um, can be used and can deliver effective amount of medication to the lungs. So here I can, I want to highlight that. First step is the most important thing. So what you can see here is to wash the bottle with soap and water and it dry for minimum of 10 hours without rinsing because we want to make sure that the static charge was lesser. And from here, the step five you can see here, new bottle, new special, new bottle special should be primed initially with 10 pounds of the medication medicine to reduce the electrostatic charge on the wall. So actually it's a lot of things to do. The customer make, make sure that it's effective uh, to use. All right. Um, okay. Washing plastic spaces in the household detergent reduce the electrostatic charge and really improve the delivery. Okay. This is a diagram on how to create a water bottles um, spacer. But actually, um, we recommend to use um, thicker water bottles, uh, like carbonated drinks water bottle, because it was thicker. So that's the best uh, custom made spacer we can make from uh, from bottles. Okay, here we can see that we measure the mouthpiece size at the back of the bottle, and we cut it. And the cut process is not easy, especially for thicker bottles. Okay, so this is interesting because uh, now we are um, trying to get as much um, commercial bottling chamber as possible. Okay, and then the fifth challenge by respiratory MTech pharmacies is about counseling and education sessions. So this is actually um, challenging because we have to assess patients with respiratory problems. We don't know that patient actually, the respiratory problem, patient coughing, patient sneezing, patient having a wheezing, exacerbation, uh, asthma, exacerbation, everything, is it because of COVID or because of asthma or COPD? So we have to be very careful on this when uh, doing the counseling. Okay, so on the fifth challenge, we have uh, we can divide it into four, which is first is to assess inhaler suitability, second thing is about to assess patient technique, and the third one is to education to healthcare providers, and the fourth one is to education to public. So we have to make sure that patients understand that why we convert nebulizer into a valve holding chamber, and many more. Okay, so this is um, 
type of inhalers we use. Okay, um, honestly to say that among all MTECs uh, in Malaysia, normally respiratory MTEC involving a lot, a lot and a lot of devices to counsel. And the, every device has their own way of counseling with different, with um, a lot of very critical steps in which every step have to be practiced. If I say they miss one step, most probably the medication was not delivered effectively to the last. Okay, this is an example of uh, inhalers. And this is another one, it's a type of inhalers. We have dry powder inhalers, for example, like tibo inhalers, breeze inhalers, uh, anero, and many more IQ inhalers. Okay, before this, actually we use um, we use this inject down to make to measure patient's capability of inhaling the device. Because the dry powder inhaler and method uh, uh method dose inhaler have uh, have different way of, uh, I mean, uh, different inhalation force. For example, the dry powder in LA patient have to inhale very, very strong in order for the medication to, to be delivered to the lungs. But for method dose inhaler, patient have to inhale very slow. It's like a normal breathing, but it should be longer and sustained. I mean, it should be uh, inhaled slowly and longer. But so, uh, with this in check down, actually we can measure patient which devices was suitable uh, to the patient. Okay, so for example, you can see here, high, um, for example, you can see the purple here, is we need the higher in, uh, inhalation force because we need the higher resistance in, 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 in order to, to make sure that the, the medication was delivered to the lungs. But during COVID-19, it's actually difficult for us to do this because actually the inject dial is not for one patient, one inject dial we are sharing. But of course, with, with um, um, one way bar, which actually is okay. But during COVID, I think we have to be, to be very careful in order to use uh, in check down to charge for the patient. So this is challenge. But um, thank God, um, Prof. Osmani, actually a uh, respiratory uh, pulmonologist from uh, um, Britain, has come up with this uh, choosing an appropriate inhaler device for the treatment of adults with asthma or COPD without depending too much on the inject down. So, but we have to follow this um, management algorithm one by one. So, we need a trained pharmacist for this. Lah. Okay. Okay. So, this is um, how we, going, uh, we, we are doing the technique on inhalers. We, are, we have to wear the uh, face shield, face mask, and at the same time, we are providing, we, uh, we call it a sneeze guard in between the patients and the Pharmacies. Okay, so we have to give education to doctors and pharmacists regarding this new SOP, new normal changes in the inhalation, uh, changes in the inhalation, changes in the referral to respiratory MTEC and everything. And then we have to educate for the public as well. Okay, the sixth challenge about the spectrometer and spirometry. Okay, actually, um, as we know, the spirometry is the gold standard for the diagnosis of a lung problem. Either we want to diagnose patient, uh, is it patient having asthma, or patient having COPD, or patient having uh, interstitial lung disease, or anything. Spirometry is uh, actually very important. Okay, but normally spirometry, um, we use this, what we call it a reversibility test, which is we need the nebulizer sabotamol again. So, but during the COVID-19, nebulizer sabotamol, we try not to use nebulizer sabotamol. So, how about that? We are thinking about how to replace nebulizer uh, sabotamol. Okay? Like I, uh, like I tell you before, actually, bar falling chamber is not shareable. So, how is it? Every patient doing this parametric, we have to give away the, uh, the, uh, the bar falling chamber. It's actually a very expensive uh, way of... Uh, being parametry. So, after further investigations, uh, we, we come out that actually the, the only one um, body chamber is uh, output level, which I call it the vortex chamber. So, this uh, chamber is output level. Um, so, it can use one patient, after that, you have to output it uh, with a high pressure, with high heat to kill all the bugs and bacteria. And and second thing is about what the dose of MDI sabotamol for bronchodilator reversibility test. So from the journals from um, this um, NHS showing that 
Four parts for MDR double comma is enough for 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 reversing Okay, all right. So and then after that, we we need to educate on the medical assistant and staffness regarding how to conduct the both, um the the reversibility test before uh, we uh, when doing the spirometry test. So we have to educate, have to check everything because they have to uh, conduct a very uh, I mean a correct technique how to use the valve on the chamber plus uh, MDI to the patient before or they doing this parametry. If not, the parametry result is not acceptable. Okay, the seven challenges is about the optimization of written asthma action plan. Okay, actually this one is actually the plan was uh, prepared to the patient so the patient can do their own way of you know, temporarily increasing the for example. For example, patient has anticipated at home so normally patients have to come to the emergency and receiving, uh, receiving nebulizer or buffalo chamber, for example. But with this written smart action plan, patients have their one card prepared so that the patient can do their own um, increasing in the dose for MDI, for example, when they, whenever they have a exacerbation. Okay, this is an example, one of the components. So we have the green area, yellow area, and red area. So this area showing that how patients condition and what things they have to do on the right side, we have the doses of the medication. For example, the yellow getting worse, for example. Patient, okay, I see that I cough a lot. So maybe I'm in the yellow zone. So what I have to do with this? So normally I have to take like, for example, patient have to take two paths PRM, one and three. But under yellow zone, maybe the doctor suggests to take like five paths. Uh, two hourly, four hourly, depends on what doctors uh, try to recommend. And then we are pharmacists, we are trying to make sure the patient understands about this. Why? Why, why, why we try to emphasize a patient asthma action plan? Because we try to reduce the uh, emergency department visit. Because uh, in emergency, we don't know. There are some patients who have uh, COVID-19, we don't know. So we have to uh, reduce the exposure of this patient going to emergency department. Okay. So this is also um, supported by uh, Gina, whereby um, they suggest to use a written asthma action plan. Okay, on the, um, for the last challenge, eight challenge about the adherence. Actually, we are still wondering how about patient adherence to the inhalers if uh, during COVID-19. But from this uh, figure, uh, K et al, showing that actually patient more adherence so the medication uh, starting from March during COVID-19, um, we believe that patients try as far as possible not to have exacerbation, which is involving coughing and everything, because you know the stigma, the patient having coughing is tried to get away from them. So this is one of the factors from this uh, journal showing that patients might try to be more adherent or compliant to medication. But at the same time, there are some patients who thinking that, you know, some patients with asthma, they are on uh, inhaled corticosteroids. So they keep reading on Google and everything, inhaled corticosteroids might cause this type of infection and so on and so forth. But from the general guideline, has encouraged them to continue using uh, inhaled, inhaled corticosteroids during COVID-19. Okay. Okay, this is my reference. Um, okay, that's all. Thank you.